So I'm Jack. You guys uh, met me from the other side over there. And our clicker is here. So the first couple of slides aren't like so important that you have to be able to uh, kind of see it on both screens. So uh, one thing I wanted to mention to you, uh, so NEHB disclosure, we'll follow that. So I, I tried to get some younger photos of Al and I. So uh, Thank you. Thank you very I was much. thinking I, I had a, a younger photo. And, uh, and that was me prior to, you know, laser keratotomy and uh, after about, you know, was it 15 years, it slowly kind of fades. And uh, so anyway, what I wanted to bring to mention here, uh, this slide is here as well as at the end of the presentation again. Uh, but you can snap a photo of this or snap it at the end. But send me an email uh, if you would like us to send you some digital printouts uh, and digital PDFs. Um, there are a couple of brochures that, that we had, and I brought one or two just for show and tell if you wanted to see them. But Al will talk about these. It's a builder's guide to SIPs. There's also one called design considerations uh, for SIPs. Uh, there's a great checklist in the back, about 10 steps of, so you're new to SIPs or panelized construction, you never used it before. This is some things you might need to know from an installation standpoint. But additionally, the other one, design considerations, is more on uh, uh, actually planning in the head. And, and you'll learn from Al why that's so important. So uh, uh, with that in mind, that's important. The also, you know, this information is on the electronic, uh, you might say, downloads. So this presentation is available for you to download, the PowerPoint, as well as some of these brochures and some of the little cost sheets of being able to compare, so I just wanted to mention that. There are some learning objectives. We won't go through these, but you're going to learn a lot about SIPs, how they go into a variety of different high seismic areas, whether it's uh, seismic DE and F, they can do that. Also, whether you're in a high velocity hurricane zone, I'm down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in the over 190 mile an hour zone, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about some of the concepts and principles. Uh, many of you may know Sam Rashkin, uh, the guy that started the Energy Star program you know, at, at EPA, those yellow stickers you see on refrigerators and, and hot water heaters and everything. And then Sam moved over to the Department of Energy and started the Zero Energy Ready Home program with DOE. Uh, and then later, probably about a year ago, retired. But he's been collecting, you might say, tidbits of what does it really make uh, sense to do when you're trying to have energy efficient construction, but homes that live well, the whole sustainable system concept. So we're here at a Systems Built Conference. So this book just came out about a year ago, and it's kind of funny, we were talking about disruption and innovation at the keynote speaker. So uh, Sam and I are actually going to do a version of this presentation tomorrow at EBA. So the Energy and Environmental Building Alliance, EBA, is actually having their trade association annual meeting in Phoenix, <laughs> just right on the other side. So I'm going to be flying over to Phoenix this afternoon to do a similar presentation for this tomorrow. But if you're not familiar with EBA, uh, it is a training platform, you might say, and community, much like systems built uh, community here at NEHB, but educational processes to help builders get to those home, ener home energy rating scores of, you know, 30, 40, 45 on the Hertz scale, so then with addition of uh, renewable energy, you can easily get to zero. So anyway, the, the, the main thing, and, and you'll see this slide again uh, when it pops up, the idea of, you know, why do in, in seven steps what you can do in three? So panelized construction is about speed. It's about not having so many parts and pieces and complexity of a process that you have to manage. So. Uh, it, the idea is simplification and getting all that same work done, but off-site in controlled places that, that you can do it a little more easily. So, uh, you know, we've been building homes the same way for 150 years. Uh, you saw the innovation curve that was flat for construction at the, at the kickoff meeting. Uh, so the idea is, is how can we just go beyond and just improve and get to the right solution? So with that in mind, I think... It is time, oh, this one's one of those phased slides. Oh, here we go. So this is, uh, uh, I was just going to mention a pitch for the, the EBA conference. It's EBA.org. They have a lot of great training that's online uh, that you can do some for free, some you pay 5 or $10. It's not very much. But uh, it really prepares you 
for the whole suite of how to approach housing as a system with great ventilation, with great you know, water resistant barriers, how to live in these homes in a great way depending on your climate zone because we know you can't build the same way in all parts of the country. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand it over to Al to kick off. Al, as the, they, they mentioned a bit in the beginning, has a few more years of experience than I do, and he's been doing this for uh, a little bit of time. So I'll let him kind of take you through this. Al has, uh, for the Structural Slated Panel Association, uh, he hosts and runs uh, and does the curriculum for what we call our SIPS school. Uh, and we have a series of 10 different trainings that we'll talk about at the end of uh, his presentation. So with that in mind, Al, take it away. Thank you, Jack. Hope everybody's doing well. I hired that guy for Structural Slated Panel Association when I was the president years ago. I've had a long history in SIPs, uh, about 30 plus years. I think I put my first SIP structure up in 87 while I was still in the military and then I went into construction and expanded polystyrene and I ran a plant for 10 years there. I started my own business running a distribution company which grew to be the largest in the industry. Uh, I built houses all over the country including all the way overseas and beyond. In 2006, I talk really fast, so you'll catch up. Uh, in 2006, I started the SIP school and the SIP school is based in West Virginia where I live in the northern Shenandoah Valley and we've been teaching and training folks from all over the world who come to little old Shenandoah Junction, West Virginia with a little bit of trepidation uh, when they see the name of this town that they're going to and then once they get there they realize hey it's really pretty nice and then uh, since then I have been working in the industry uh, doing a lot of training speaking and consulting uh, I work in predominantly SIPs I also work in cross laminated timber CLT uh, we build structures and consult and work and I mostly Anymore, I'm helping people start SIP plants. A lot of people want to get into the SIP manufacturing um, or expanding certain SIP facilities, and that's where I come in and show people how to do that and do it properly and efficiently and things of that nature. So um, that's where I've been for the last 30 plus years, so on and so forth. How many people by show of hands have been uh, worked with or been involved in a project that has used structural insulated panels? Good, probably half the room, super. Um, so I'll, I really like to take questions while I'm moving through this, so please don't hesitate to holler out and it'll help, uh, it doesn't, doesn't trip me up or maybe it'll just challenge me to, to keep, uh, keep things in order. To start talking about the history of SIPs, I would say that uh, laminated uh, construction has been around for a long time. There's nothing new. I'm not suggesting that the Egyptians were out there uh, building with SIPs, but they certainly were practicing with things known as that, that were involving lamination and the building that goes therein. Uh, in the 30s, 40, late 30s, uh, structural state panels truly came to light and we started to figure this all out. By the time we hit the 40s, um, the uh, uh, processes that were being used by um, uh, Alden B. Dow uh, were starting to be known uh, in the industry and using the concept of better utilization of the natural resource, which is wood, here in North America, and we started figuring out how to better use it. This was the start of making plywood and OSB and things of that nature. So we moved along from there. The SIP, uh, um, it, SIP industry started in the late 80s, actually 90 was when it got started and it was really started by a lot of timber framers. People in the timber framing industry realized that timber framing and SIPs when married together become a perfect joinery, pun intended, of how to take a really good structural component and then wrap it very quickly with something that increased the performance and worked well together. Once SIPA started in the 90s, which I've been a member of since about the beginning of it, um, we have really worked to promote SIPs in general, and, and in my case, mostly in the education of SIPs. Um, it really notched up a bit when OSB and the industry figured out how they could make skins as large as 8 by 24 feet. So you'll hear me refer to as a SIP as a jumbo, and when I say jumbo, I'm talking about a panel that's a 8 feet by 24 feet. So that really allowed us to start working towards that speed element where we could put panels up very, very quickly. Uh, and then along comes CNC fabrication where we can start uh, designing uh, using CAD-CAM, uh, BIM modeling, and working through those uh, uh, aspects of it. So what is a SIP? In general, it's three things. It's skins, it's a core, it's laminated together. It's not really strong before it gets laminated, but once you laminate it, it becomes very rigid. The, um, the components uh, in various orders of the facings, OSB is the predominant one. It is the ubiquitous SIP within the industry. Makes up about 90 
98, 99 percent of all of the true sips that are sold in the industry. But we can make it with different skins. Uh, we can use metal, we can use concrete. Magnesium oxide is uh, making a good headway into the industry, as well as composites. One of the new areas where if we want to become an innovator, we can think about how we can use composites to make structural insulated panels as well. The rigid foam is predominantly expanded polystyrene, EPS, closed cell foam. Also used in there is XPS, the extruded polystyrene, also known as, you know, styrofoam or the red or the what are we, blue, yellow, green Pink. extruded boards, right? <laughs> also urethane. Urethane is used, uh, used, I'll show you some photos here shortly. Uh, it's a poured polyurethane, not sprayed. It's going to be a poured polyurethane to fill the void and create the core. And then the structural adhesives that are used are no different than the adhesives that we're all pretty familiar with that are used in LSL, glue lambs, uh, eye joists. Um, typically it's a moisture cured urethane adhesive uh, which binds it all together. It goes into a press and, and I'll show you some other photos of that shortly. We can use SIPs in floors. Uh, they work well. Uh, the one key note is to remember that when we have a diaphragm and we beat on it, those tend to transmit sound. So we don't have uh, a really large amount of use in SIP floors or SIPs in floors unless we're trying to separate ourselves from Mother Nature in the cold weather. So sometimes when we're up um, on top of pilings or we're off the ground and we really need that uh, good insulation and we don't have somebody living underneath of us, that's where it works quite well. Um, when it comes to walls, if you can design a structure that's being built with anything, I can pretty much build it out of SIPs. It's, uh, there's no limitations. And one of the reasons I have few limitations is because of the strength of the panel. I can put it up quickly and the panel's going to carry all the loads that are necessary, whether they be axial, lateral, or racking loads, um, as well as we get a nice straight wall that goes up very quickly. In addition, of course, where they really start to shine is in the roofs. If you want an insulated roof deck, you want vaulted or cathedral ceilings. If you want to close things up quickly and be able to span large distances, a SIP often will meet the needs of the design when it comes to putting up uh, open floor plans and big open vaulted spaces. Works quite well and gives us all that insulation that we need as it goes up. How do we manufacture them? I'll brief, go through this really briefly. The closed cell foam predominantly is EPS. It starts out looking like sugar or salt and we apply a little bit of steam to that. That releases the pentane gas, which is the blowing agent, which all plastic foams have. That foam expands, turns into little tiny beads or balls. Those little beads or balls trap air. When they trap air, it doesn't allow the movement of air or energy through the wall. Once those beads are put into a mold and we put more steam to them, it turns into a solid block of foam. Now we've got a big block of foam that we need to slice into smaller pieces before we bake that Oreo cookie, if you will. So we slice it with hot wires. The wires that have a voltage applied to them, it becomes hot and it slices through that because EPS is a um, thermoplastic. It will melt when it gets hot enough and we create that nice smooth slab. And then from there we can slab it and we can put it into a press after applying adhesive. We can apply adhesive with roll coders or bead extruders or any number of different types of applications where the glue is applied to the core and then that core will then go into a press where it's held for anywhere from five minutes to an hour depending upon the type of glue, the humidity, the temperature and things of that nature so that then it takes a set and it becomes a structural element in that press. That press could be hydraulic, pneumatic, vacuum, a bunch of different things that we can use um, and once it comes out of that press it then goes into fabrication. The urethane process is slightly different. I'll jump through that. It typically tends to be a continuous process where we have presses that act look, look more like trank, tank treads where the material moves through and when the material moves through we've got a skin on the top and a skin on the bottom and then a manifold which pours that polyurethane, the A and the B component which mix and then as it expands, it expands to fill the void and adheres to either skin. Okay, So the difference between an EPS core and a urethane core really is just the difference in that the foam in urethane is the adhesive. There's not a separate adhesive. Okay. So those are the differences that you deal with. Once the urethane goes through that machine, it comes out into a finished panel, and then it can go into fabrication. Is this the same for uh, non-OSB skins? Is there anything? Uh, it, oh, for non-OSB, 
uh, the processes are almost identical. You've taken the sheet goods, you're going to put it through the same process where there's a lamination and then into a press. I've laminated composites, MGOs, concrete or a cement boards, whatever it is. Doesn't matter. I can, I can laminate anything. I can laminate your flannel shirt if you want. It doesn't matter to me. Polyurethane will stick to everything. Doesn't care. Okay, question. Is that panel that you just showed, is that the end product that's used in the wall panel? Or is there a structural framing that goes along with it to give it structural integrity? So is it the finished product? Yes and no. It's the finished product and it is the panel which we would then refer to as a blank panel. Now what do we want to do with that blank panel? Typically it's going to be fabricated to meet a design and then it's going to be put in the field and installed. That fabrication may include the windows, the doorway openings, the rake angles, the compound cuts, whatever it might be, and lumber included around the perimeter of that panel or around the openings of the door or window. Your question, is there more framing? Only in that the framing is used as needed by either engineering calculations, where we have very high winds, high uplifts, high racking loads, whatever that might be that requires additional framing. But the reality is, no, we don't need studs. We don't need a timber frame. We don't need steel. We don't need things to hold up our building if in the design we have allowed for the fact that the SIP and the strength that the SIP brings to the table can meet the needs of the building in the environment that is being built. Does that answer your question? So, EPS, polyurethane, XPS, they all have subtle differences, slightly different R values. Some of the R value lingo is all about marketing, to be perfectly honest with you. They're all closed cell. They all perform basically in the same manner. They all have similar compressive strengths. Uh, polyurethane is slightly higher, XPS is in the middle, EPS is a little bit lower. They have different perm ratings. They all, however, when figuring in the totality of the panel, all act as a vapor semi-impermeable vapor barrier. Okay? Uh, if you're not familiar with vapor barrier, where did my book go that was up here? It's being passed around somewhere. Hold it up in the air. The book in the back, written by Joe Steebrook, Building with SIPs, Structural Insulated Panels. He gets deep into the weeds if you want to talk about that sort of stuff, and it's a good book to uh, review if you're serious about going into structural insulated panels. I recommend it. Uh, fire resistance. I want to talk about that for a second because a lot of people say, hey, fire resistance. Question. Fire away. I'm going to roll you back just a second. Roll me back. So you're saying that you do not need a vapor barrier? No, I, didn't not, I did not say that. So it's semi-vapor impermeable. Do you need a vapor barrier? Yes or no? That's a question that the building scientists in me and others will argue about till the end of the earth. The panel in itself will act as a vapor barrier, but where is the weakness of any system? It's at the joints, it's at the connections, it's at where we seal that joint. So is there the potential for air movement or something through a joint? And then do we need a vapor barrier? And where does that vapor barrier go? The beauty of a SIP is it's bilaterally symmetrical in the way it has the capacity to dry in either direction. So where we're building will determine what type of vapor barrier and or the need of back ventilation on the outside. But I'm going to get a little deeper into that after our break. Fire resistance. Everyone wants to know, well, what about fire resistance? The thing about fire resistance is a fire rated assembly is an assembly. It's tested as an assembly. We don't look at stick frame walls and say, hmm, let's see if this 2x4 will burn. We throw it in the fire and go, guess we can't build out of 2x4s because look, it burns. That's not how we test fire rated assemblies. We develop an assembly by design and we test the entire assembly, including what's on the inside, what's on the outside, and we determine how long that assembly will handle fire exposure, whether that be 15, 30, 90 minutes, two hours, whatever the case might be. Panels have been tested as an assembly. There may only be one layer of jip. There might be multiple layers of jip. There could be other layers of other things that provide additional protection to that panel. The panel in and of itself will only handle a fire exposure for so long. Obviously, it's wood, right? It's a wood skin. It's going to burn up. If it's metal, it's going to get weak because it gets hot and it loses its capacity to handle those, the strength, right? So everything has those limitations, but panels are all been tested, they all have ratings, you can define what that rating is by merely looking at the test data that is provided by each and every one of the manufacturers. 
Uh, different sizes and thickness of the EPS. Again, EPS will go all the way up to an 8 by 24 foot panel. There are a few polyurethane manufacturers that will build a jumbo panel as well. Um, and I put bug proof in here because there is the capacity for us to provide a treatment, I'll say, to the foam and to OSB, which enhances its capacity or ability to resist things like carpenter ants and termites. So depending upon where you might be building, you can utilize these processes or these treatments that will prevent that type of problem, i.e. carpenter ants or termites in your structure. Questions? You, on the, on the bug proofing, floor. So what would the typical bug proofing look like in terms of the material that's being applied? So there's a couple of different materials that can be applied uh, in the process of manufacturing EPS, which is the one that has the ability to utilize that material is a diatomaceous earth or a disodium octoborate tetrahydrate, which is a material that is really mined out of the ground and it's a mechanical irritant to those critters. It's not a poison, it's not toxic. Um, one of the largest uses of this same material is in baby clothes because it adds to the fire resistance of clothing, believe it or not. It's right under your feet right now in commercial carpeting where we use that same process or that same materials, again, to improve the fire ratings of certain upholsteries and such. So when we apply that, the foam then creates an inhospitable environment for a critter that's trying to crawl into it because it's like broken glass to them. It cuts them up and scars their exoskeleton and makes them all, I'm not an entomologist, but they don't like it. Okay? But, but do, you, do you actually treat the lumber itself as well? Lumber can also be treated as well. It's a slightly different process. It's similar materials in that that wood now has uh, improved fire ratings because it cr makes it less likely to want to burn. It also makes it less likely for molds to be uh, used in uh, molds to grab a hold of that wood because it's treated. And then it also provides that bug resistance. So you can do both. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if you've already got the closed cells or for the panels, how are you getting electrical and plumbing? Let's talk about that in a little bit. It's a great question. It's probably the second question I get asked more than anything else after price is electrical. But I've got some slides and I'm going to address that not to cut you off, but we're going to get to it. Other questions? So panels can be made in four foot wide by whatever length, up to 24 feet, unless you're working with composites or metal, in which case we could go to I don't know, 50, 60, 70 feet, how big is your truck? I can make you a panel as long as you want, as long as I got a continuous press, doesn't matter. Okay, if we're an OSB, we're up to the 24 foot length. Um, there's a big difference as to whether or not you want to use that size. It might be a limitation because your manufacturer doesn't make a jumbo panel or doesn't want to make a four foot wide panel and presses everything into a jumbo eight foot panel. It's just a difference in what your market has, what your supplier will provide you. Uh, the manufacturers throughout North America, most of them ship more than just regionally, but in large areas. So you can always find somebody that'll fit your needs. But as I often say, if you're putting an addition on the back of a house and you got to carry the panels through the garden gate, you're not going to be carrying an eight by 24 foot panel, right? 700 pounds doesn't exactly get carried real well by the labor force. So there's a big difference in those two uh, items. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit later about the philosophy of tight structure because as soon as we make a panel bigger, we have fewer joints. And as we pointed out earlier, the joints tend to be the weakness in any system. So if we eliminate a good large percentage of the joints in the system, we have the potential for making a more energy efficient, high performing system because we have fewer places for air to move through this structure. And believe it or not, I'm one of those people that believes you cannot make a building too tight. You just have to ventilate it right. Buildings should be tight. They can't be energy performance unless they're tight. Tight is right. Ventilate is also proper and important. Okay? And I'm also one of those people that doesn't believe houses need to breathe. Houses don't breathe. We breathe. Houses dry. There's a big difference. Houses don't breathe. They dry. I breathe. I like to dry out too occasionally. but. I, Houses don't breathe, they dry. So always think about that. And I'm gonna talk about it more when we get into more of the building science a little bit later on. OSB, metal, and cement, different skins have different pros and cons. Depending upon what you're trying to build, what you're trying to do, what your code requirements are, will determine which of the skins may be best for your project. It's you know hard to say, uh, depending upon where you're living. 
I can tell you that the work I've done in Central and South America, you can't sell them a wood skin panel. Why? Because it's a cultural bias against wood. A wood house in Ecuador is a cheap, temporary, poor person's house. They don't want to live in a wood skin house. You couldn't sell it to them if you tried. It would be the best house in the world. Oh, it's wood. I don't want it. North America, do we have a problem with wood? N no, we got plenty of it. We've grown up living with it. We understand it. We're pretty comfortable with it. It's the same darn panel, but it's just a cultural bias. So that's why we work more with composites and uh, cement and MGOs and things in different areas. Some people want to go down into the deep south where termites are prevalent or moisture concerns, and all of a sudden they think, oh, I can't do it with wood. You can, requires the proper detailing, but they want to switch over and look at some other type of skin. Okay? I'm not going to throw stones at any one of these skins. I've used every one of them. They all have pros and cons. Just be honest about what the pros and the cons really are before you decide to jump into that realm. So we talked about blank sips. Somebody asked about, is that the finished panel? The blank sip is just that. It's like selling a sheet of plywood. How many do you want? Now, is that the best way for you to order a panel package? I would suggest not. If you were very well versed in how SIPs are utilized and how they can be cut in the field and you have the right training and the right tooling to do so, then sure, knock yourself out. The one area that I have been involved in in several cases where I would order blank panels is a reclaimed barn. There's no such thing as plumb level or square in a reclaimed timber frame. It doesn't happen. And I'm not going to pay to have panels fabricated in the factory just to bring them out into the job site, just to have to recut them all because it's not plumb level or square, right? Makes sense? So understanding the limitations in blank zips is very important because the next one is to say, okay, I want my panels to be pre-cut. The manufacturers in our industry are well versed at taking the plans from the average builder or architect in whatever format that it might be and converting that over into a quotation or a panel layout drawing. Panel layout drawing be that which determines how the panels are laid out, where the joints are, where the loads are required to be handled by interior posts or supports or things of that nature that allow this system to work for your design. And then that fabrication or that panel layout drawing typically gets converted if CNC or CAD uh, computer-aided machining is being used, gets converted into a machine language, which then takes this panel and cuts it up exactly as it was drawn. Works out pretty nicely, right? And then once that gets sent to the job site, it fits back together just like the computer said it would fit back together, right? There's a lead time when that happens. How much of a lead time? Well, how long does it take to get trusses? The truss industry does the exact same thing that the SIP industry does, right? It takes your house, it says, how am I gonna hold this roof up? Okay, we'll put it through the software, okay, we'll design it, engineer looks at it, it gets stamped, boom, they have to manufacture it and ship it out. So when you say, what's the lead time for a fabricated SIP? Depends on the time of year. I've seen trusses take, what, 10 days or 10 weeks. SIP industry is no different. It happens in the same way for the same exact reasons. We can take the prefabricated SIP, this one over here that we designed and fabricated and made ready to uh, go out to the job site, and we can go one step further and we can call it a ready to assemble or a ready to install. Terminologies that are used within the industry, RTA or RTI, it simply means that now we've taken the panel and we've pre-assembled some of it, we've put all the lumber in it, we've packed out the windows and the doors and we've done a lot of the things that we can do in the factory and do it quite efficiently as opposed to doing it out in the field. So now we have a panel system. When it's delivered to the job site, the installers can simply go out and grab panel A1 because they're putting up the A wall and start standing it up. A2, A3, A4, and keep moving around until they get to the B wall. B1, B2, B3. Following that panel layout drawing, following the fact that your panels have already been uh, pre uh, packed out with all of the lumber that is necessary, posts, internal lumber, things like that. The only thing we can't put in at the factory is the sill plate and the top plate because that ties everything together and that still has to be done in the, in the field. Make sense? These are some photos of the uh, CNC equipment that is commonly used in the industry. Um, the Hundegger is one of the most common ones. It's a 30 horsepower, seven axis machine that uh, once it's got that program, 
we can slide a, a eight by 24, oh jeez. We can cut this thing up, it looks like a chainsaw that goes very, very fast. It's actually cut with a chain, double barred chain, carbide tip, very, very fast, smooth as if it was cut with a circular saw. Um, Styles is another manufacturer, Weinemann's one, C.R. Andrew, you've probably heard of some of the major machine manufacturers in the industry. They all have uh, a project or work that they do within our industry that uh, moves things uh, very quickly. There's a couple of photos of the saw, the bar, and different, this is actually an older unit, so they even look sexier now than they did in this picture, okay? So that's the CNC part of what we do, which allows us to make panels pretty quickly and get them out to the field very, fairly quickly, all right? Moving into some of the details of how panels go together, because you're thinking to yourself, well, okay, how does panel A1 fit to A2, and how do I move all these things through? We have different details. This is the most common in-plane spline joint. When you're putting two panels together, you have to have one panel and the other fit together, and there's a spline. We can do it with a, what's called a block spline, or an insole spline, or a mini sip. Depends, it's just a smaller piece of sip that fits in between the two, and once it's nailed off, it transfers that load of both shear and or creates a diaphragm within that wall or floor or roof assembly. If the panel itself won't handle the loads, we could, instead of using a block spline, we could incorporate lumber internally into that panel at the spline joint. That lumber could be single lumber, double lumber, L, um, uh, you know, laminated engineered lumber, single or double. We can, we can dial in how much strength we need in that panel based on the type of joinery that is used. The one thing that should be noted is that when you go to a lumber internal, we are now creating that thermal bridge. Right? That thermal bridge. If we put lumber in our system, one of the things I try not to do because I like this joint where I'm using a block spline or a surface OSB spline. I know you can't see it over here real clearly, but basically it's allowing the foam to remain continuous through the envelope uninterrupted by lumber. Because if I go to the next one, I've now got lumber in there which is creating a thermal bridge. Not to mention lumber does what? It, shrinks, twists, moves, cr cracks, checks, cups, does all those things that potentially can then create air movement through our system. And if you will remember, I said I like buildings to be airtight, and that's hard to do if I've got lumber in them. It's harder, shall I say, than when it's like this. These panels have structural capacities that we know what they are because they've all been tested, right? When you know what those capacities are, you can design for it and then add lumber as is necessary let the panel do the work it's gonna do. If an eight inch panel on your roof isn't quite strong enough because you're building in you know, the high snow country, and instead of putting lumber in it, go to a thicker panel and you avoid being able to have to put lumber in there where you might not need it, okay? So there's the lumber joint, it's a typical in-plane joint. Hold downs, we've incorporated connections and hold downs and things that handle high seismic. I've run a lot of panels through different labs where we test for high seismic all the way up to the E and F. Um, and there's those details that are necessary to do so. In a lot of cases, just the attachment of the panel with the nailing pattern at the base plate and the top plate and the vertical joints, and we're getting uh, racking shear strengths of upwards of a thousand pounds per linear foot of a regular wall. Nothing too terribly fancy in it. All right, floor sips. We can use panels for floors, we don't often, but once you've got a, port, a floor panel down, we're simply putting a plate and moving up from the, with the wall panel on top of that. If it's a concrete slab on grade, no problem, love it. We're just gonna have to separate the wall panel from that concrete with a capillary break, whatever that might be, to prevent moisture movement up through that wall assembly. We can also, to get better thermal performance, if we wanna have a conventional floor system, we can use a rim sip as opposed to putting in a rim board and then letting the lowest paid guy on the job site go insulate those little floor cubbies. You know how they shove the insulation in there and it looks like the guy was thinking about last Saturday night as opposed to how to do it right? Now we can solve those issues with something called a rim sip where we're basically removing the rim board and putting in a sip in its place. If we get to the corner details, we're simply looking at a panel that has dimensional lumber wrapped around the perimeter and then it is 
put together typically with large screws. Those screws will go all the way up to about 16 inches. The screws will pull the system together and become part of the fixing or fastening details. Along with that will be a variety of different sealants. In these slides where you see the red, that is an indication of sealant. Could be a mastic, could be foam, could be an expanding foam single or two part component foam, and then it seals together. When we go from floor to floor, we can always platform frame like we typically do in conventional construction, I'll call it conventional. And then again, we've got to rely on, you know, uh, the guy who fills up the floor cubbies again. Or the other alternative is we bring the bottom floor all the way up to the top of the wall and then we put a hanging floor in there. It's a stronger wall. I think it goes in as quick or quicker than a, a conventionally framed wall. It's definitely uh, stronger without any question because we increase the diaphragm capacity by tying that floor system in between the top of the lower wall and the bottom of the upper wall panel. Okay? One of those little details. Questions? If we get up to uh, the top of our wall and we're ready to put a roof on, we can bevel cut the top of that wall, insert a double beveled piece of dimensional lumber top plate, apply adhesive uh, or a mastic, sealant, gaskets, depending upon the manufacturer that you're working with. Some have different nuances in their sealing systems. And then the roof panel can go on top of that. And once again, you see the large screw which comes down through and ties everything down. How, what the spacing of the screw is, could be 24 inches, could be three inches. It depends. I did a project down in Big Pine Key after the hurricane came through and wiped it out. We put up four structures and they handled 200 mile per hour wind. It's, and it was just regular sips, nothing, nothing crazy. Structural ridge beam, sips. A lot of screws and the screws were in really close spacing because of the 200 mile per hour wind. It is the engineering calculations that determine what those fixing spacings are. In many cases above and beyond what the manufacturer has specified as a normal. Then, when we are working with roof sips, of course, we have to think about what's holding the roof up. It's the first thing I look at when I look at a set of drawings. I, I'll use any number of these things. I can use a structural ridge beam. I can use low bearing walls. I can use purlins. I can use a timber frame. I can use trusses. I can use, although I'll point out that putting sips over top of a conventional truss system is like buying two structural packages, right? I don't need a structural truss package and then to put a structural panel on top of that necessarily. Now, let's say I wanted to span or separate those trusses and put them every six feet and make them a girder truss or something that allows the panel then to turn in the opposite direction and span from truss to truss on six foot spacings, eight foot spacings, timber frame, 10 foot, 12 foot spacings. What's what the typical span on that 40 pound roof load? Question What's the typical span on a 40 pound roof load without center support? Oh, without any lumber in it, probably. Because yeah. again, the splines, you've got lumber or no lumber, right? Gotcha. So if I'm going to design for the maximum efficiency in the largest panel, I look at the charts that say how much, how far can I span and carry 40 pounds? And it might be uh, 12 to 14 feet horizontally. If I start putting lumber in there, I might go up to 18 or 20 feet. Okay. Ridge details, when I get to the top of the ridge, I've got a couple of options. If I've got a structural ridge beam and it's carrying the top of the panel at the ridge, I don't need more lumber above that. That's again, more lumber above a ridge beam. Doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'm gonna break the panels up to the top. We're gonna cut and then fill that joint, foam it up properly. We're sealing that joint completely. This joint is the most critical joint in all, all houses, all high performance houses, because that's where hot, moist, humid air goes, right? Due to the stack effect, it always goes to the ridge. That's where it tries to get out. And when it gets out, we all know bad things happen, right? It condenses. Bad things happen. Question? Question. If you can do that on a ridge, why not do that on a corner of a wall? Mostly because of racking and shear strength. If without that lumber in the corner and without that fixing connection, you don't get that. I don't have a structural connection between this plane and this plane in this joint other than the screws attaching to the structural element below. So I've got a ridge beam, truss, or something of that ilk, and the transfer of the moment, if you will, of that 
corner connection is transferred through some structural element inside the corner. If it was a timber frame and the panels were coming together at the corner, then your question is very valid. We can do that. We don't need lumber in the corner because we're not relying on a connection like this, right? We needed the lumber there. If there was a big timber frame post right here and I'm looking down at these two walls, guess what? I can take these two pieces, or I can take this piece of lumber out and leave a gap and foam it up and make it very airtight and it works beautifully. It's a good question. Question? Uh, do you care about thermal bridging? Do I care about thermal bridging? Not as much as I care about air leaks. If I was to define through uh, energy modeling the um, the penalty that I'm going to get by putting uh, lumber in the roof at the joints and what that um, penalty is because of thermal bridging, uh, it's not nearly as much of a penalty as if my air leakage rate goes up by, you know, from 0.2 to point, or 0.2 to 8, something like that. It's a much bigger penalty. So although I would like not to have that, it always looks better when we do thermal imaging on a, a SIP wall or any high performance wall without all of those big bright red stripes in it that says we have thermal bridging. But I'm very serious when I say, yeah, I care about it, but not nearly as much as I care about making that joint airtight. Question. For a flat roof application, is the pitch built into the panel in manufacturing or is that done on job site and installation? That, we're getting ready to take a break here in just a yeah. second. Um, the, so the question is about flat roofs and pitch. Uh, we obviously worry about draining water. SIPs are not ideal for a flat roof. I worry a little bit about it because it has to be detailed properly. Um, it's a little bit like using wood in you know, the deep south where you have moisture and termites and things and you have to detail and install properly. So we want to create air movement underneath our finished cladding and typically the slope that would be built into that would be done in that that separation back ventilation furring strips. Does that make sense? All right, one more slide then. I think we're jumping into ah, perfect timing, installation basics. Let's come back after a quick break of 15 minutes.